Hey, welcome to another Sacred Cow Barbecue. I'm Patricia Aiken, an average host with exceptional guests, and I want to invite you to run over to InsideTheEyeLive.com. That's InsideTheEyeLive.com, just like it sounds, and join the live chat. If you're hearing this live, of course, on Thursday, October 29th. Dennis Fecho, the amazing host of Inside the Eye Live, has graciously allowed us to commandeer his chat room on Thursday night. And actually, he's rather responsible for this show tonight. Saturday, he devoted his show to, to South Africa. Karen Smith spent an hour, then he had on two other guests, an American expat living in South Africa and a South African living in the Middle East. For one, I couldn't believe what I was hearing from the second two guests. And apparently neither could Karen Smith and some others from South Africa. So I said, you absolutely must come to the barbecue and rebut these claims these men have made because they're so outrageous. So I want to give a shout out to everybody in the Inside the Eye live chat room. Saturday mornings is my guilty pleasure. The Inside the Eye live chat room are the most informed people I know. I only wish they lived around the corner so we could get together in person. So tonight I'm going to introduce my guests. Karen Smith is not only a tireless activist for justice in South Africa and brilliant spokesperson, Karen is the newest host here at Revolution Radio. Her show, Radio Free South Africa, will be debuting on Saturday, November 7th from 2 to 4 p.m. Eastern. Woohoo! Karen, welcome back to the barbecue. I'm so excited about your new show. Yes, yeah, so am I, Patricia. This is an absolute marvelous miracle that happened. So happy how it's all coming out. We have a South African resident, a person with South African resident status who actually is living abroad right now. That's Arthur. Why don't you introduce him and and say a little bit about him and tell who else we're trying to raise? Yes, sure. Because we want to rebut the show that that happened on Saturday, we thought we'd bring in the same type of guests that they had on there. So there's myself. There's an American who lived in South Africa for two years, and then we have a South African who lives in South Africa. Our American guest is Arthur. He's got permanent residence in South Africa, but is now living back in the States. And our South African is Lee, who works with South African Family Relief Project, a charity that works with the burgeoning white squatter camps in South Africa. We have taken notes on the show that happened on Saturday, and we will be talking about them one by one. So there are two things I would like to do. One is try and reach Lee, so if you'll excuse the phone ringing. We've been battling to add her, and I would really like to try and reach her so that she's part of the conversation. And then we will bring on our friend, Arthur, who will speak to you about his experiences and his shock as an American living the South African experience. Okay, wonderful. Well, let's uh, let's start with Arthur for a minute while you're trying to get Lee on the on the horn here. I know she stayed up all night. It's only 5 a.m. in South Africa, and she was gracious enough to stay up all night because she, she was afraid she'd asleep through this. Thanks for staying up all night, Lee, and I hope it uh, wasn't in vain and we can get you on here tonight. Arthur, welcome to Staker Car Barbecue. Thank you so much. Hello, Patricia. How are you? I'm awesome, and I'm just delighted that you're here, and you can share from an American's perspective what, how you felt about living in post-apartheid South Africa for two years. What did We had a lot of comments here in the chat room. Which one really stood out to you as being so alarmingly wrong? Uh, the fact that it's not in your face, the crime and the violence and whatnot. I mean, the first week I was there... The power went out in downtown Johannesburg, so the taxi drivers, and and they're not legal taxi drivers, you have to understand. They're driving stolen and parted together Toyota minivans. They converged on downtown South Africa and created a gridlock that it took a day and a half to clear. There were 25,000 of them. They decided to have a taxi war at that point. There were like 900 taxi bosses killed in the weeks to follow. And we only lived a mile from downtown Joburg, so it sounded like the 4th of July. Power goes out and the taxi drivers decide to have a taxi war. Yeah, yeah, they just descended on downtown. In fact, the the first headline I sent my, my brothers back home said, Welcome to hell. In Johannesburg, downtown Johannesburg, having load shedding, being no power. Oh, no, that was probably from them stealing the power cables because they'll... They'll hook a, a bucky, what they call a truck, a bucky to the power lines and just drive off and pull them right out the ground. 
Well, that's effective. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> very. Mr. William DeHewitt, who's an American writer, he says, living in South Africa, he said that the the only place that there was any problems were in the black townships. That's the only place that people get killed. And what about the 85,000 or so murders that have happened in the cities? Um, and that's not counting the farmers since 1994. What did he do? Does he hide behind his security fence and never go anywhere? He must. Um, I mean, a gated community is a wonderful thing, but I don't think gated communities are all that safe anymore because of the load shedding. No, they're not. Well, everybody there lives behind security walls. And I mean, they've got iron spiked posts. And on the other side of that, they've got glass embedded walls with razor wire. I mean, it's really unbelievable to actually see this stuff firsthand. Our neighbors next door were robbed. They jumped right over those iron spike gates. They cut their hands up on their glass. They don't care. They're there, they're there to steal or kill. Did you feel like you were constantly in danger? Were you able to be armed? I know they have gun laws. Well, we weren't able to be armed, no. They, uh, they really frown on firearms. Most people cannot own them at all. Uh, ammunition is almost impossible to find. They do sell knives, though. They <laughs> Switchblades are legal there. So, you know, I, ha I had to get one of those. I had to send a couple back. Yeah, it's, it's amazing how nobody can see that. I, I just can't believe because when I had to go to Home Affairs in Germiston, which is uh, like a suburb of Johannesburg, uh, there was a trucker's strike. Bad enough being in Germiston where you have to stand in a queue that there's no organization for that line. It's just whoever pushes to the front gets in. And in the meantime, in the street, they're throwing bricks through truck windows because there's a trucker strike going on. And, I mean, they show up by the hundreds of thousands. And, I mean, this is pretty much downtown Johannesburg. And that's not a township. You know, that's bigger than Chicago. Wow, that's absolutely amazing. I'd like to know if you see the signs of this happening in America today. Absolutely. Not quite on that scale because, thankfully, in America, it is legal to be armed in most places. Right now. <laughs> they're working on it. Yeah. They'd really love to take our guns, and they're, they're trying real hard. I remember the second time I interviewed you, Karen Smith, she said that gun registration was the first step towards gun confiscation, and people on gun rights people in the U.S. are being warned about that. But it's a Trojan horse. It really is. Yeah, it's absolutely true. And, and the other thing, you know, everywhere you drive, and, and we dri drove all over the country from Durban to Zanin, which is way up north to way down south, uh, you'll pass through these areas with huge signs and warning signs that say carjack areas. We were living in the part of Joburg that was pretty upscale. It was over by Eastgate. Right across the street, there's a little shopping mall. And I mean, I watched a carjacking there take place and who was the victim were they black uh, or white a white girl they drug her right out the car beat the hell out of her and attempted to steal her car what happened the police showed up oh because my it was gosh. Right there. well it was right in front of the police station almost and they have what they call hawkers that stand in the middle of the street at every stop sign and they they sell anything from cds to fruits and veg to electronic equipment, and they'll come right up to your car, and if you roll the window down, well, that's most of the time they don't want to sell you anything. They will actually yank you out of your car. How is it that Mr. William DeHewitt doesn't know this? Well, that's what I was kind of in shock. I'm, I'm wondering that. Now, the South African media, they're real bad about reporting this. They won't report anything. And, and you know, another thing, he was saying how you don't see it. He's in the Eastern Cape there. Well, East London is a town there that the very day he was talking, they were having the the school riots there, the university riots. And literally, that whole town was on fire. But he didn't, he didn't know that. I was just shocked. I go, what South Africa? There must be an altered reality here or something. I, I'm missing this. This is another dimension. It's not the South Africa that I've been learning about. Well, like I said, maybe he hasn't left his security walls. Uh, we <laughs> We went to a mall at one point. I, I don't remember which mall it was. And the police had just shot somebody. 
Well, they don't close off the malls like we do here, so you can walk right in, just don't go around the police tape. So I'm watching this guy's bullet-ridden body with his head bouncing off the escalator step, and the police, the police are trying to keep the other blacks from stealing, from looting him, and not keep people away. They're trying to catch the people that are trying to steal whatever this guy stole. Uh, it's like the Three Stooges and that. Yeah, and the, and the other thing. I don't, I don't know how he's never seen this. You walk by an ATM machine. Well, the, the armored trucks pull up to guard it, and we have actually seen them push people out in front of moving cars because they got too close to them. And, I mean, these people have machine guns in your face. They shoot the R5 down there, which is a really awesome-looking rifle. But they are not afraid to stick those right in your face and tell you to back up. Is it even safe to go to an ATM? Well, not really, but we do it anyway. Yeah, this is a whole nother side of uh, of the world. Had you ever been in South Africa before, w during apartheid, Arthur? No. It's always been on my bucket list. I I believe it's probably the most beautiful country in the world, and I still was... love to see it. But it's it's being demolished now since the ANC has taken over. Oh, it's it's being hammered. The the other thing is I don't know. With the government there, the actual government, Zuma and the, the ANC and Malema and his EFF, they outright call for, for the running of the whites into the sea. Hey, you know, the honeymoon is over for you whites. I put that on a big sign. And so the fact that the second guest that Dennis had on, a man that went by the name Mr. C, who was a, a non-white from South Africa, I don't know what his actual lineage was, but he said he wasn't. He wasn't white and he wasn't black. He was some other race, a, a collection of races. And he said he didn't even know what the word Uhuru meant. Yeah, I, I find that amazing because when I was there, Zuma was just, he was running for office. He wasn't elected as president yet. That was a big thing there was he was going to call for Uhuru. So the white people were, were very much against him. The fact that Malema really helped put him in office, as I understand uh, yeah, him and Malema have a great relationship. I mean, they were buddies one day, and then he decided he was going to ban Malema from the ANC and, and bankrupt him. It was going to be end, the end of his political career. And Malema just comes up with his own party because he has so many of the youth there following him. He's not only come up with his own party, they, within a couple of short years, are the biggest threat to the ANC today. What do they promise people, Arthur? I mean, what, what do you see? What is their power? I see Malema as being a big jerk. He's like just this big bully that likes to shoot his mouth off. I, I don't see anything of that's, substance coming out of this that's, man. That's exactly what I saw as an American. I, I have no clue as to what their power is or how they can get so many people. I mean, he's a funny guy, that's for sure. Yeah, well, I don't think killing off all the whites within 48 hours, that is find that, that humorous. No, no. Karen, do you have anything to add about this part of this conversation? I am just listening in amazement because uh, the, the, if you listen to the two American stories, the one on Saturday and this one, there's absolutely no similarity. Arthur and I have spoken at length about his visit <laughs> to South Africa, and he has other things to tell you about living behind eight-foot walls and, and things. And th This is what I experienced, but it was always great for me to hear it or to see it from an outside point of view, because you live with it, it creeps up on you, and you don't realize how strange it is until somebody points it out to you. Right. Gradualism. And absolutely. They change things so slowly there. He wanted to tell you about not being able to work there. Oh. Yeah. You're yeah. a white man. Why, why, you, know, you don't have any right to work. You, you have no rights to anything. You're the oppressor of the world. Why would you want to work? Well, ab absolutely. He had said something, somebody had asked him if he worked down there. He didn't even make mention that there are 137 laws to keep you from working just because you're white. Now add a foreign national to that, you cannot get a job. And that, that's one of the big reasons that we moved back to the States, because a man doesn't live behind his woman. I admire that, Arthur. I really do. I want to bring up a point, and maybe you can corroborate, maybe you see it this way from, from an American perspective. But I look at the taxation that South Africans were under all during apartheid to support these black homesteads in the, in the Bantu homelands. 
and in neighborhoods and all the programs that they did for black hospitals, black schools, all that. And I look at that could not be done without the Communist Manifesto. In the Communist Manifesto, one of the planks is a heavy and progressive income tax. And that's how they steal from the people. And so they can they can prop up these non-white races against the whites. I see this taxation that they were under for years and years as being the root of the problem. Well, they do have one of the highest taxation rates in the world. How far behind can America be? Um, if you add all our taxes at once, see, they have a, what they call a VAT tax. And if you added all our taxes, our sales tax, uh, our income tax. Uh, Road taxes, gasoline taxes. Tax breathing. We're probably not that far behind them. I see this is what they're doing. They're giving a sense of entitlement to non-white races and stirring up dissatisfaction with the whites and saying how, what evil oppressors they've always been. And these people seem to buy that, even though there they are. They're, they're taxed to death to provide a great life for these people that aren't working. Another thing I'd like to say that amazed me as an American down there, they have the black squatter camps, that they have government-run housing, that they actually get built really nice houses, solar energy for and whatnot. Well, there, there was a riot there, and they burned one whole camp down because, and you're not going to believe this, because they didn't build bulletproof toilets. <laughs> I'm, I'm speechless. I'm serious. <laughs> bulletproof toilets. Yeah, and guess who was behind the burning of that unit down? That was Malema. Yeah. They didn't have bulletproof toilets, so they weren't going to live there. So there's, yeah, there's no violence in your face. The two years that I was there... I saw an entire police station stolen under armed guard, but the entire station was stolen. I'm talking the toilets, the pipes, the electrical wires, the counters, the tiles off the walls, the whole thing. What did they do with them? Lord only knows. But, I mean, they have a whole building stolen while it's under armed guard. I've had cops with their machine guns in my face. The really funny thing was I was stopped. I have an international driver's license. And I was stopped, and I handed the cop the international driver's license. He had no idea what it was. He looked at it. He looked at my passport. He, had, he was holding both of them upside down. He threw them back in my window and said, you go, and started yelling at the guy behind me. I mean, he was mad. You could tell, you, you, you pull over right here. <laughs> well, he probably but, uh, can't read. Yeah, I saw a huge pick and pay strike, which is a great shopping center there that was less than two blocks from my house. And they were striking at the head office of pick and pay. And they bust these people in. And like I said, this was a, a fairly uppity area in Johannesburg. There were probably two miles worth of Greyhound buses or, or that size that they had bust these people in to participate in this strike. That's the communist way of doing things, don't you think? Agit agitators, professional agitators bring people. It's there. effective. It is. It's, it is. It, it's effective. I've driven through Zion City where they go for their religious holidays, Easter and uh, Christmas. And I tell you what, it's a five-mile-long valley that three million people get packed into with no toilets. Oh. For four days. And I had the pleasure of driving through that. An hour and a half to go five miles in that mess. And, and the people do. They'll stand right in front of your car and, and you know look at you and surround the car and whatnot. So you just you just go as best you can. In Durban, the beaches are so packed on, on the Christmas holiday, especially because it's summer down there. I've seen the pictures of that. It turns your stomach. They do not provide outhouses. Those people just shit right on the beach, and they pick it up with bulldozers and dump it straight into the sea. Kind of yeah. makes you want to jump right into the ocean, huh? Yeah, I, I don't see how you could not see the violence and, and the filth and the things that go on if you actually live there and go anywhere. Well, it seems that Mr. DeHewitt said that it was only women and old people that were killed. Like that, really? Like, yeah, that's, that was one of his comments. Oh, they only kill women and old people. Like, that's acceptable. In the park that we lived in just in this last week, we lived by a park we used to walk our grandchildren in. Um, there were... Two white couples murdered and raped. Once they were done raping the women, they drowned the men in the lake. Downtown Joburg. 
What time of day does this happen? Lunchtime. You know, I have a, a history of crying whenever Karen's on the show, so don't start. Don't start with me because I'm going to end up crying here tonight. I, I went to a, a campground on the coast that was a very upscale campground. It's called White Clay. It was not only overcrowded, there was a sewer line that was broken. Now, this is this is one of the, the top dollar uppity campsites you can go to in South Africa. World famous. The guy next to us said, you might want to tie cans around your tent because we've had several burglaries and attacks in the last week. So, I mean, anywhere you go, anywhere you go, it's it's right in your face. How can you not see it? You know, on the good side, I, I got to, they, they grow avocados down there. And while I was up in Zanin, I got to climb the tree and pick some of my own avocados. And the thing I really liked about that is the avos down there are the size of small watermelons. And I'm not kidding. They're a couple pounds each. I've seen those in Hawaii. My favorite are the shiny, thin-skinned ones. Those are my favorite avocados. I I miss being able to pick them off the tree. (laughs) Isn't that great? Yep. It really is. Yeah, what what a beautiful country and seeing it being destroyed like this. Yeah, and I while I was down there, I got to see uh, before and after pictures, which have been taken off the web now, and I don't know why, but the before and after pictures, heartbreaking. I mean, it was like taking a section of extreme northern California up by Crescent City and turning it into the desert outside of Fernley, Nevada. That was how radical the differences are. In terms of just the mismanagement of the farms or the infrastructure, I, I don't understand that comment. They steal everything that isn't bolted down. And I mean everything. Like I said, entire police station and two schools while I was there. Uh, in fact, the schools, even the bricks were taken. They don't like something, they just burn it down. Oh, the yeah. bus isn't on time today. Let's just burn the bus down. Like, that's going to make it on time. And the trains. And the trains. Oh, you should see the way they pack onto the trains. And they burn the trains, too. If the train's late or they can't get on, they'll burn it. It, yeah, I, I just don't understand that mindset. I really don't get it after years of education and, and say that the education hasn't been quality. They just they just haven't been well educated. That's nonsense. Yeah, it's a, it was amazing. As an American, it, it was amazing. It was like half of it was like watching uh, The Three Stooges. The other half was like watching a Freddy movie. That is a really interesting analogy. That's going to stay with me for a while. Three Stooges and Freddy. Yeah, it doesn't, it doesn't make any sense whatsoever. It does sum it up quite nicely, though. It does. Um, that, that really says it all. It really does. They're like the Keystone it's, it's, Cops and Freddy. I can't get over that I recently learned, and I believe I learned it from, from Karen, that they now not only cannot keep the power on, but they can't keep the water running. Like I, I've always said when I lived in, in a third world country, I always said, okay, I can do without electricity because you have sunlight 12 hours a day, but I can't do without water and I have to have a well or something. But shutting off the water in a city has got to be yeah. unbelievable. Yeah. Now, another point I'd like to make is now my experience there, I was there uh, just prior to the World Cup. So their security at that time was above the board because they were expecting international visitors. They had way more security than they, than they would on any normal day. I still saw all of that. In fact, uh, there was a murder of two American tourists on the Howe train uh, right there, right at the airport. And that was during the height of security that's ever been in that country. So after the World Cup, things really got ugly, and that's when I decided we needed to move. I needed to support my wife, not vice versa. I can't imagine how bad it's gotten now. And for somebody to tell me that you don't see it if you're in town, just just... It it just amazes me. And like I said, Zanin is all the way up by the Zimbabwe border. White clay is down by the Eastern Cape. So I literally went from one end of the country to another. What else stood out here, Arthur? Kruger National Park. I was able to get into Kruger National Park. We had a fantastic guide. So within about three hours, I saw four of the big five. It was awesome. Uh, when the rhinoceroses came in front of the car, we were in a little Toyota Corolla. They trotted across the road. The whole car literally bounced off of the road. Wow. Yeah, it was awesome. We were looking at a hippo down in the creek, and we went about another half mile, and our our guide, Dion, he says, look, there's a lion. And I'm looking at this thing. uh, That's not a lion. 
He says, yeah, that's a lion, man. Are you crazy? So I got my video camera and I'm zooming in on it. I said, that's not a lion. It's some kind of cow. I shut up in mid-sentence. I said, holy crap, that's a lion. (laughs) (laughs) I I didn't know they got that big, but they are. They're the size of a beef cow, a wild lion. Oh, my gosh. I had no idea. But I know I've seen pictures where they eat the tires off the car. You can't really leave your car parked around lions. Uh, they're amazing animals. I got to pet white lions at the lion park there in Joburg. I was in there with a full-grown cheetah, and, and I actually had to slap his paw to get him to sit up for the picture, but it took the most awesome picture. He was sitting up behind me, and I was turned around looking at the camera, so I didn't even know he had sat up. Made a fantastic picture, and I got to pet five-month-old white lion clubs that probably weighed as much as I do. That was a little nerve-wracking. I bet. It doesn't sound like a guy like you would turn down that kind of a challenge. I'm Oh, I had to go in there, you know, but slap, slapping the cheetah's paws really cracked me up because if I'd have known he had sat up behind me, I probably wouldn't have been in the picture. <laughs> <laughs> so I want to ask you a couple of these things. Uh, someone blames apartheid and the lack of education for the, for the problems today. Does that just, how does that strike you? I think the person talking about the lack of education during apartheid is the one that lacks the education. Because I've been there. I've seen the before and after pictures. I've talked to the older blacks. We were having an extension built onto the house, and they were just fascinated by the American, you know. And and so I, I talked to them. They actually said that things were much better during apartheid. They didn't have such a hard time, and that the kids now are out of 